Brad Keithley right here on the Michael Duke Show. He's got a little insight into what goes on there. He's also got a blog called Thoughts on Oil and Gas. It is a discussion uh, on the industries that help drive Alaska's future. He became interested, uh, though, here a few years ago in the actual sustainability of what we're doing in the state and has been trying ever since to bring us back into line to where we could live within our means. Brad Keithley joins us this morning to discuss current events. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you today? I am fine. How are things in lovely Cape Breton? <laughs> they they are wonderful. And ironically enough, I'm sitting in the parking lot of the of the very place where that tune was written. So um, <laughs> a, a little bit of, of circle of life here. That's exactly how it works. Welcome to the world of technology. We could be anywhere and doing anything. It's it's good stuff. Brad, let's talk a little bit about what happened in the legislature last week and. And what? Where do we go from here? I mean, it's it's the the the, the crisis, quote unquote, is averted. The shutdown is averted. I definitely have some problems with some of the things that they added into this bill, but it's left a lot of issues on the table. What what are we dealing with here? What are your thoughts on the budget bill that passed on Thursday? And uh, let's just start with that. Sure. Uh, so the operating budget uh, does get us funded uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year. It does avoid the shutdown. Uh, but there's a lot of things it doesn't do. Uh, it doesn't provide for capital. The capital budget uh, wasn't part of the op- wasn't part of what they passed, and so we still have a capital budget to go. Uh, oil taxes. They didn't resolve the issue on oil taxes, and in fact, they created a new one that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and it isn't a long-term fiscal plan. It is uh, probably, thankfully, given where they were going on long-term fiscal plan, it is just a a year solution as we continue to work on the long-term plan. Oil taxes, there's a couple of things in the operating budget that are that are important from the standpoint of, of sort of where we are. Uh, one is the PFD cut. Uh, the legislature, the, the, the governor last year ignored the PFD statute uh, that, that sets the amount and provides for how the PFD, the PFD is to be calculated. The governor uh, overrode that with a veto, cut it in half, this year, the legislature has done that, uh, cut it in half. So the legislature ignored the PFD statute, reduced it by $1,100 to $1,200, uh, and, uh, and set that amount in the operating budget. And then the legislature, interestingly enough, and I'm not quite sure I've run to, run to ground what the, what the thought process was, but the legislature also underfunded uh, the oil and gas tax credits that are required that are provided by statute. So they ignored the right. statute on on that as well. The uh, uh, the amount that that the governor estimated would be required under the statute was roughly seventy five million dollars. Uh, the legislature funded about fifty five fifty seven million dollars of that. So there's a short funding uh, with respect to to that as well. In in a budget that was bigger than it needed to be. Uh, those, those short fundings are, uh, strike me as odd. Yeah. And I heard that and I was thought that's, that's really weird. I mean, because we did, we could all agree that taxable cash credits need to go. That's been an agreement. It was written in intent language. They, they've all put that down on paper. Uh, but then of course, with the statutory minimums, it was like, why throw this up in the air and make it, uh, and make it cautionary. And this is after, it seems like the Senate gave a lot of ground, uh, uh, more ground than than I thought that the than the House did. I mean, the Senate had proposed an additional almost three hundred million dollars in payments on top of the statutory minimums, and they have gone back the other way. They proposed, uh, you know, whatever it was, sixty nine mi- or uh, you know, I guess it was sixty nine million in cuts for um, for schools, and they end or fifty nine million in school, and then they end up giving back an additional nine million. Uh, and all the House had to do was stop talking about forward funding by two billion. I mean, it just seems like it seems like the, the Senate was on the, the short end of this stick when it was all said and done, in my estimation anyway. I, 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 I don't disagree, but I think we've only seen uh, part of the part of how this is all going to play out. Again, we haven't seen the capital budget yet. And the capital budget, is a necessary piece in order, at, at a minimum, in order to set the state up to qualify for matching federal funds for our highway projects. Uh, if we don't have a state match to the to the federal funds, 
then we don't get the federal funds and uh, and the highway projects uh, uh, aren't fully funded. So we need a capital budget uh, uh, at, at some point in the near future. Uh, once once you say you got to have a capital budget, then then there's a lot of things that can be thrown in uh, on top of that. The capital budget really is just another is just another category anymore. It's just another category of spending. They throw operating items uh, into the capital budget on a fairly routine basis. So, for example, uh, Speaker Bryce Edgman said we may see uh, there's there's an opportunity for additional PFD uh, to be put in the capital budget. I'm not holding my breath on that, but but he hold, held out that hope. Uh, that may be where we see. Uh, oil and gas tax credits uh, showing up also. They may have the the, the Senate may have agreed uh, to a lower amount on oil and gas tax credits in contemplation that as part of the trades that will go on in the capital budget, uh, we'll see more uh, oil and gas tax credits show up in the capital budget. I'm concerned about the capital budget. To be honest, this the long term sustainable number that we've always talked about, whether it's 4.3, 4.2, 4.1, 4.0. Uh, is includes both operating and capital, the, the unrestricted general fund portion of both operating and capital. Uh, the, the, the budget they passed, the operating budget, was 4.1, and everybody was, you know, claiming victory that they'd gotten it down to some somewhere approaching the long-term sustainable level. But that's only part of spending. You have to look at the capital budget. And if they throw a bunch of money into the capital budget, uh, as as the Senate proposed, uh, at least with respect to oil and gas tax credits, uh, if they throw a bunch of money into the capital budget, then that's going to blow the budget out even further uh, than the than the amount that was that's in the operating budget. So, right. um, I, I'm I, I'm there, there's another shoe to drop yet, uh, and it's not clear what's going to be in that shoe when it does drop. Well, what's interesting here is, again, they're doing the victory lap selfie over this 4.1, which, by the way, is a lot of accounting gimmicks anyway, because they're talking about that's UGF, but they're not talking about a lot of the expenditures. It's not expenditures. It's just UGF draw. And so they're not talking about expenditures that are coming out of separate accounts and everything else and already. And they're patting themselves on the back. Hey, look, we got it to 4.1. But again, disingenuous because they still have to add capital budget things and everything else. We could be well up over five billion dollars by the time it's all said and done i mean this really could be one of the bigger budgets that we've seen yeah it's uh uh the 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 dgf portion the the uh, uh designated general fund um is it has become a game over the last few years originally the idea was designated general funds were things like the pfd where you had funds set aside for designated uh designated uh uh, uh spends and and the D, DGF budget took care of those. Over the last few years, as we've gotten into this budget situation, and and people have wanted to look good, they've taken funds out of DGF, and and really covered UGF items, unrestricted general fund items, out of DGF to make the UGF budget uh, look smaller. And there is some of that uh, that went on this past time, but the capital budget is really where we where we need to be concerned. It it, it could blow up. I mean, they they could. There could be trades in there. Uh, uh, for example, they could try to do forward funding of, uh, of the schools again through the capital budget. They could try right. – the Senate could try to push for, you know, the 200-some-odd million dollars in additional uh, oil and gas credits in there. It, 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 no one should – no one who's concerned about the state's fiscal situation should, should stop breathing uh, breaths of concern yet about FY 2018 until we see what the capital budget is going to look like. So that's the next big thing. And, of course, it's also locked us up. Not only do they have to deal with the capital budget, which is not even on the call yet. The only thing that was put on the call was the oil tax bill, the oil gas, you know, the oil tax credit bill, which uh, the, the, the two chambers are way far apart. I mean, worlds apart right now on where they want to be. And so there's really, quite honestly, nothing, nothing happening uh, uh, on this, right? No, I, I think even in the back rooms, there's not much happening. I think the uh, the Senate sort of has locked in, locked their heels in. I don't think they want to budget on the oil tax bill. They say they want to repeal uh, the cash oil tax credits and turn it into something else. Uh, the House uh, wants to repeal it also. 
but the House doesn't like what the Senate wants to turn it into. Uh, and there's disagreements also certainly about changes in, in tax rates the House wants to make, some major, major structural changes to the way oil and gas taxes are calculated, uh, including the rates. The Senate doesn't want to do this, d- doesn't want to do that. So uh, there's, there's wide disagreement. I don't see a whole lot of, of, of emphasis or, or impetus for reaching a compromise on that anytime soon. The governor would like it because he'd like that. Uh, the issue of, of revenues that might be derived from increased oil and gas taxes uh, resolved, uh, but I just don't I just don't see a whole lot of, of common ground there that they're going to be able to find. You would think that that they might be able to agree on uh, on resolving the cash oil oil credits, uh, terminating those. The problem is that uh, the, the the House doesn't want to do that. Doesn't want to give up that piece unless they get full-scale oil and gas tax reform. They're concerned if they agree to a bill that just has the termination of cash oil credits in there, the Senate will just stop talking. Uh, right. So they're, they're holding on to that to try to keep the Senate's feet to the fire. Uh, but, but the Senate, uh, frankly, I don't think feels much heat on its, on its feet. So he, he feels much heat on its feet. So I don't think the, uh, I don't think the Senate's really motivated to try to get to a deal. Yeah, and and again, uh, since they're, I mean, we just saw the quote from Andy Josephson. Oh, they're so wore out after being down there for six months at three hundred dollars a day, which I mean, I guess is good work if you can find it. But uh, you know that they're just there's just no interest, and so now essentially it's a skeleton crew. It runs out in July the fifteenth, but there is a hard deadline apparently for some capital projects into September, right? So they will have to come back at some point if they want to get some of the federal matching grants and other things done. Uh, before the summer is over. Yeah, they, they, they have to come back. It, there's a little disconnect. I mean, some people say July, some people say September, but there's a little disconnect on when you when we have to get back uh, for the capital budget. They will come back for a capital budget. There's no doubt about that. They're not going to let uh, the federal matching funds go, uh, go without uh, taking advantage of it. Um, so it's a question of when they come back. It's a question of how they come back. Uh, the governor is going to try to leverage them into doing oil and gas taxes first by not expanding the call of the capital budget. I think we'll see that sort of run its course in the next in the next week or so uh, when there's no progress on oil and gas taxes. Uh, he'll he'll be faced at that point to you know figure out how we're going to bring them back in on the capital budget, and they have to agree on a capital budget. Uh, so, uh, but there will be a capital budget. We will be back uh, uh, before. September is the latest date I've heard. So we'll be back sometime before September uh, to resolve a capital budget. All right, Brad Keithley is our guest. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about where is all this money going, this government money? And uh, how's it helping or hurting the municipalities, plus Governor Walker's standards and his new hope on his pipeline, his gas pipeline, his pipe dream. That's all directly ahead. Brad Keithley right here on The Michael Duke Show. We've been talking about what's going on down in the uh, legislature. What the what are the next steps that the legislature is going to be taking? Obviously, not a whole lot of movement now since their vote last Thursday, which I guess I, I want to touch on this just briefly for a second, Brad, because, again, problematic. We saw Shelley Hughes defect from the caucus, basically saying this was not the right budget. There weren't nearly enough cuts and it attached a PFD. We saw some of the minority members do the same. I mean, they could have fought it out. They only needed a couple more minority members to come on board and they could have they could have uh, stopped the budget as it was and talked about reinstituting the PFD and some other things. I mean, if if they're going to do a short term fix, they might as well not gut the Alaskan economy while they're at it. And yet we saw some legislators <laughs> fold down on it, right? Well, I think you're talking about CBR vote, the constitutional use of the constitutional yeah, budget. Yeah, exactly. Reserve, which, yeah. which requires a three-quarters vote of, of each body. And, and traditionally, uh, in, in prior legislatures, when the Republicans were in control, what happened was, the, in the House in particular, the Democrats – uh, controlled more than a quarter of the vote. So you needed some Democrat votes in order to access the CBR and fully fund the budget. And the Democrats used that as leverage to increase uh, spending in certain categories uh, before they would give their votes to the CBR. The, the right. problem this time 
was that I think everybody was ready to go to the earnings reserve account, um, which is the, the another uh, savings account. It's managed managed as part of the permanent fund by the permanent fund corporation. It's the earnings off of the permanent fund. Um, it's never been used to help fund the operating budget, but as you and I have discussed over the last couple of years, it's certainly there, and it's part of the Hammond 50-50 plan uh, to help fund government. So I think I think what they were faced with was the reality that if you didn't give a CBR vote, um, they were the majorities were just prepared to go use the earnings reserve account and bypass the need to get the three quarters vote. Um, and and so it really it, it it didn't provide the same sort of leverage it did in the past. It it couldn't really have stopped uh, what the majority was doing. Once you're faced with that, once you're faced with the fact they're going to do it one way or the other. The question then becomes, what's the best way to do it? And the CBR is invested largely in short-term um, in, in short-term investments. As a result, it doesn't earn the same rate of return as the earnings reserve account does, which tends to be invested in longer-term investments. Uh, and so, if you're going to use the cheapest or the or the lowest returning savings first, you would go to the you go to the CBR. And I and, and Shelley's taken some criticism for that, and I've certainly not shied away from criticizing Shelley in the past when I when I felt it appropriate. And Shelley's taken some criticism for, for for voting for the CBR, but frankly, I would have done the same thing. If you're going to be end run in any event, if they're going to go to the earnings reserve account in any event, then let's use the account that has the that has the lowest cost to government of right. of drawing out of it. And the CBR was that. Yeah, and and I think it just it comes down to, and I, I had not taken a pulse as to whether or not they were willing to go to the earnings reserve. Again, it was good. that would cost us, by the way, not just a few bucks, but tens of millions of dollars, based on the amount of return that's going on in the ERA right now. So mm -hmm. it, it it wouldn't have made sense. Um, but I, I I still feel strongly that if they had just taken a stand together, they could have at least painted the uh, they could have at least painted the Democrat uh, Democratic majority in a I guess in a worse light than what they already were at this point. It at least made a fight and, and then been able to say during election time, we're the ones that fought for your PFD to get your full PFD. I mean, there's some yeah. politics involved in that, but it would have seemed to have made sense. There, there are politics involved in that. It would have been positioning. It would have been, it would have been posturing, um, and um, and 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 would have would have made for some uh, publicity uh, in the campaign. But frankly, Michael, I think everybody was tired and ready to go home uh, down there. And that's not an excuse, but but I think I think we, as a result of that, people were ready. People were ready to go use the earnings reserve account to fund government if they had to. So. In that situation, it really was a question about which which account do you want to draw from, and if the Republicans had made that stand in the House, for example, uh, and 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 refused to give a vote on the CBR, and as a result forced them to go to the earnings reserve account, what the majority the the, the soundbite the majority would have had going home is, hey, what are these Republicans doing? They're obstructionists, and they're forcing us to spend more money uh, by forcing us to go to the earnings reserve account than giving us their CBR vote. So. It it really I mean it, it was a lot of positioning could have been a lot of positioning but but frankly economically I think they made the right decision on that not on, on anything that. else but on that yeah uh, Brad Keithley is our guest we're uh, talking about uh, oil and gas and uh, the budget and more so Brad let's uh, let's take a look a little bit now as to the effects of what's happening in the go in the budget yesterday. I had some deeper analysis on this new ISA report that came out, and um, it was really kind of shocking to see exactly how dependent. I mean, I knew we were dependent in this state, but it was a little shocking to see exactly how dependent we become on government largesse. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, the ISA report is fascinating, and, and I'm glad you did a deeper dive on it. Uh, the report says between 2005 uh, and 2015, which is the numbers they had, uh, that the share of borough revenues, these are borough revenues, not they're not including cities, but the share of borough revenues coming from the state more than doubled. In other words, over the course of the last 10 years, uh, the share of the budgets, uh, the local budgets uh, that are derived from state revenues have more than doubled. Uh, and that's a that's a huge that's a that's a huge increase. I mean, if you want to you want to think through where the state money is going, 
that sort of increase in the allocations to the boroughs uh, is 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 a significant share of it. Uh, in another part of the report, uh, it summarizes that $1.6 billion of the state's roughly $4.2 billion operating budget, the operating budget they just passed, of that $1.6 billion, more than a third uh, is going to the boroughs in, term, in, in, in support of paying school debt, employee retirement obligations, education, and general revenue sharing. Um, so, I mean, that's more than a third of the state budget is going out to the boroughs and the local, and local government, the local school districts, uh, for, for, for payment there. And that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a huge amount of, a uh, huge amount of the budget that's, uh, that's going to the localities. It's, it's, it's significant, I think, uh, of the amount per person that's going out to the boroughs in the, in the, in the, uh, largest boroughs, Anchorage, um, uh, Juno Fairbanks, Matsu, uh, the the per person amount of state uh, spending that's going into the boroughs is relatively small, around 250, maybe up to 500 dollars in, in in the smallest of those boroughs uh, uh, per person uh, in state funds going into the borough. That's per person in the borough, but in the smallest boroughs, it's up to 5,000 dollars per person <laughs> per person in the borough per citizen in right. the borough coming in in terms of state funding. That's a huge amount of money that is that is coming from the state into the boroughs. If you think about trying to levelize that across the state somehow, uh, uh, you would either increase the the largest share, or you or you should be able to decrease uh, uh, what's going to the smaller boroughs down to down to more reasonable standards. So, this study I think is going to is going to be good um, a, a good source of additional analysis on where we might find additional spending cuts, uh, focusing not only on the schools, because that's part of the $1.6 billion, but focusing also on the money that's going for other things in the boroughs. Well, what I found really interesting on this was, again, we could see that we've created dependency across the state, and we've only increased it over the last 10 years. One of the more interesting stats, from my perspective, was the fact that Juneau, which is our fourth largest city by population, um, they're receiving they would have to pay over a thousand dollars per person to be able to offset the governor at spending that they're receiving in Juneau uh, compared to 275 or 250 in like Fairbanks or in the in the valley or in the in the Anchorage area uh, and so to me that was just another indicator of why maybe we need to start thinking about moving a few mm -hmm. things out of the Juneau into more of the core area specifically the legislative session yeah, Juno is certainly a company town. I mean, it's it's and, and the company there, you know, Ketchikan was a was a was a pulp and paper mill town for a lot of years. Fairbanks is a military town. Uh, Juno is certainly the company there is the is state government, and state government certainly looks out for uh, for Juno uh, in turn. I it's it, it, there's a lot of things that are that are problematic about having the capital down in Juno. It's remote from most of the population. Uh, it creates a bubble effect uh, uh, where legislators don't get out. Uh, when, when, when they see anybody, it's from Juneau, it's from the state government or dependent on state government. Uh, but the fact that Juneau is taking that much in state funds uh, is uh, is problematic. Uh, also, as somebody who used to sit on a on a on a, a local seat up in Fairbanks, I can I can I can I can see you sort of salivating about getting that much up in Fairbanks. Well, I mean, I know because I was never a fan because I understand. See, I understand. I understand that there's a hook in all that, that every time you take that money, not only do you create a dependency on state government for that money, because I've seen it in times of good and times of bad. Um, but I also understand that there's a hook in the state then having a larger say in what you can or cannot do in your own mm -hmm. municipality, which I think is problematic mm -hmm. as well. I mean, the but but the dependency to me is the biggest problem because once you've created that dependency, I mean, it's, it's an addiction. It's like a drug. Once you've created that dependency, it's almost impossible to break it. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it, it's, it has another effect that's fairly obvious when you think about it. If there's no causality, if there's no, you know, if, if building a new school or building a, uh, you know, a fancy new school doesn't cost you anything, if it's going to come from the state, then, you know, the local pressure is to build the fanciest you can get, you know, use as many 
local contractors as you can get. Uh, uh, make it make it a public space where we can do all sorts of all sorts of things in it. And that's sort of been the that's sort of been the the drive. Even in places like the Matsu, it's sort of been the drive to 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 when things are being funded by the state to do them at 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 high cost and at high scale uh, because there's no consequence to it locally. Uh, right. You you get cost controls. You get co- better cost controls when you have to fund things. The, the more local you have to fund it, the better cost control you have. So if, so if somebody sitting in the mass who sees a new school going up. And and all sorts of, of, of whiz bang things being put in it, uh, and all sorts of great architecture being done on it. If they have to pay for it, they will they will stop that. They will they will put constraints on it. If they don't have to pay for it, if the money's coming from the state or coming from the feds, then they don't really care. The, the more right. that's spent, the, the the better. So it's um it we we have created issues by not matching cost responsibility uh, with with spending we, we by disconnecting where the money's coming from with the locality we've created uh, an incentive to have the biggest and the, and, 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 and the brightest shiny things as opposed to the most economic things Exactly. Well, we saw that now with the Sullivan Arena announcing that they're going to need a six hundred thousand dollar subsidy since the aces left and their primary culprit they say is the fact that they built this hundred million dollar alaska airline center that's now competing with them so now we've got two competing government entities trying to trying to take over the same space it just makes no sense it it uh that that airlines arena has been a problem <laughs> it has been st- something that yep. bothered me since, since the beginning it's never made money yep. for itself it's it's been a drain on the state i i really don't understand why we did it but but we did uh, all right, we're down to the last two and a half minutes or so. The Alaska gas line, Governor's Pipe Dream. Uh, we're approaching a do-or-die time for it. What say you? Uh, big date coming up. They've gone out with what's called an open season, a non-binding open season, to, to get expressions of interest on using the line. The governor essentially has said that that we need to see progress this year, or he recognizes that that the money we're spending, the activities we're undertaking may not be the most efficient thing to do. Even he recognizes that. This open season runs until August 31st, uh, September 1st. The, the, it's, a, it's a process by which potential users of the LNG project uh, will state their interest uh, with the expectation that they will then move from that to binding contracts by uh, spring of next year. So it's sort of a, it's sort of, it, to some degree, it's a put up or shut up date. Uh, that AGDC and the governor are facing. If they don't get expressions of interest that make that line economic, it's going to be hard for them to continue to make the case that that AGDC needs to be spending as much as they are, that they need to be running uh, as hard as they are uh, in chasing chasing customers. If they don't have customers expressing interest, I think I think the case for shutting that project down uh, becomes significantly greater. So, big period coming up. Uh, important to follow. We'll be following it uh, in our discussions here. Um, this is this is going to be sort of the break point for uh, for the AGDC, I think. Yeah, and of course, everything that the governor's doing, all the all the the taxes and everything else, is all in part trying to better Alaska's fiscal situation enough that they can borrow money to to do this. In my opinion, <laughs> this is all part of the governor's end game. Could 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 well be. The governor always said he wanted to be the LNG governor, but I think we're gonna we're gonna come to we're going to, for lack of a better phrase, come to Jesus here on, on whether or not yeah. uh, this project's going forward. Yep, absolutely. Brad Keithley, Thoughts on Oil and Gas is his blog. You can find it and more out there. Also on Facebook, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, thanks so much for being part of the program today. Uh, we really appreciate it. <laughs> it's Tuesday.